Um, I don't know what to say about my career as a writer. I've always loved reading. I've always loved language. Um, it wasn't until, I mean, in high school, all I was interested in was skateboarding. I wasn't a good high school student. I made enough grades to keep my, you know, good enough grades to keep my parents off my back so that I could skateboard more. Um, I did that. And then I took a few years off between high school and college, which is what your parents don't want you to hear right now. Um, I took time off, and then I eventually went back to college. And I was in college when a, a wonderful world literature teacher in Corpus Christi, a man named Mike Ansaldua, came over to my desk. I think we were, I think we were studying the, the Iliad. And he came over to my desk, and he put, a, he put a ticket on my, you know, just in my hand. And he said, go to this. And it was for um, a reading by the novelist who turns out to be quite famous, a guy named Robert Stone. He, he wanted me to go to that reading that night. Until that time, I had never laid eyes on a living writer. I, in a weird way, sort of didn't know that writers existed anymore. I thought of all writers who, who had written the books that I love to read. I thought of them the way I thought of Shakespeare, the way I thought of Homer. I thought they were long gone. And so I went to this reading. It's the first reading I'd ever gone to. And I went in knowing that I loved to read. I went in knowing that I loved language. I went in knowing that I loved to write. And an hour later, I came out knowing that I wanted to be a writer. It seemed to me a dignified way to spend your life. Um, and so that's what I've been trying to do ever since, is, is to envelop myself with language, to spend my time surrounded by books to spend my time surrounded by people who really care about words. Um, and that's pretty, that's pretty much it. That's what I still try to do um, when I'm not skateboarding. Um, I'm trying to think of, like, of any like, interesting experiences that I had. I pretty much put myself through graduate school by writing stories for that series, Chicken Soup for the Soul. Um, they pay really well. Um, the problem is, is that Chicken Soup for the Soul is not the highest literary brand in the world. And so I didn't want to associate myself with it, so I came up with all these kinds of pseudonyms. The best was Don Keys. Don Keys. <laughs> Push those words together. Um, so I was getting pretty significant checks made out to donkeys <laughs> for most of my graduate school career. Um, and I think that's all you need to know about me as a writer. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read a couple of short things, and then we can talk about whatever y'all want to talk about, Ramses or decapitated crocodiles or um, the UHV baseball team, which I hear is very good. Um, this is a very short story, um, and because I heard everything about the crocodile, this morning, I thought I would read it. Um, the story is called Cayman. Your mother wouldn't let me bring the ice chest into the house, so I left it in the garage. Earlier, I had cut four holes into the styrofoam lid. One of them looked like half a star, which I remember liking. This was years ago, a windswept Sunday. This was Texas. When I returned to the kitchen, your mother pointed at the sink. She said, wash your hands with soap. She was breading flounder. She had been listening to radio reports about that little girl who had been abducted. So would I. Probably I pulled over and gave that man $80 because I thought it would keep you safe. He was parked under the causeway, a hand-lettered sign propped against the tire of his van as if he were just selling pecans. Your mother had flour dust on her neck. She had already fried okra, boiled potatoes. Soon we'd call you to the table and you, our little man, would bolt in like you had heard a starter pistol. You were seven. A boy who liked bedtime stories with fantastic monsters and twisty, unexpected endings. You liked sneaking up on us. You hid behind closed doors and in the laundry hamper, then jumped out screaming and laughing. You loved the word maybe. Maybe I'm a kid who's a million years old. Maybe we should be a family with a pet. Maybe someday my eyes will turn blue. Your mother swiped her forehead with her wrist. The kitchen was gummy with the day's heat. The windows were open. 
Before leaving that morning, I had mowed the yard. You helped me rake. You wore your cowboy boots. And now, with dusk coming on, the cut grass smell was rising and trying to cool everything off. She's still missing, your mother said. Now they think the uncle did something. I nodded. I had heard that too, and if it was true, I thought he'd get killed in prison. But I didn't want to talk about such things. Instead, I asked, how's our little man doing today? Worn out, your mother said. He's napping in his room. I had been all day at the job site, drawing overtime. On the drive home, I had seen the man under the causeway, and I pulled over just to have a look. Our ice chest was still in the bed of the truck from when we had gone floundering. I took that as a sign. And he only had one left, which also seemed lucky to me. I was excited to surprise you. I was excited to hear what you would name it. Now, I said, I wonder what he'll name it. He asked for a dog, your mother said. A pet. I said. He asked for a pet. Right, she said. A dog. A cat. A goldfish. Pets have fur and show affection. Pets aren't deadly. Goldfish don't have fur, I said. I didn't think she was angry, not really. I took three glasses from the cabinet. I said, and it's not deadly. She fixed me with her eyes. She said, it's an alligator. It's a caiman, I said. There's a difference. It's the size of a shoe. Not for long, she said. She turned back to the stove. She laid one piece of fish in the skillet, then another. Grease started snapping. They're smart, I said, repeating what the man had told me. They won't mate until the river is high. They make sure there's enough water for their offspring. They build nests. They're cold-blooded, she said. They have scales. Danny can take it for show and tell, I said. <laughs> They bite, she said. They escape. They escape into sewers and terrorize neighborhoods. They eat regular pets. <laughs> I laughed at that, but your mother just said, they do. She flipped the fish in the skillet. The sound of frying started up again like distant applause. She blew hair from her eyes, stood with her hip cocked, holding the spatula. The applause quieted. She slipped the fish onto a plate she had covered with a paper napkin to soak up grease. She put two more pieces in the pan and watched them sizzle. She said, why would that man take that little girl? We don't know that he did, I said. But you think he did? Yes, I said, I do. I do too, your mother said. You know, she's Danny's age. They could still find her, I said. But you don't think they will. I don't know, honey, I said. I just don't know. Well. She said, I don't think they will. She lowered the flame on the stove and turned to stare out the window. She was touching her fingertips to her thumb, one after the other, something she did when she was concentrating. The air in the room was shifting. She said, what would we do if something, it won't? I said, not to him. She nodded, pressed the heel of her palm to her eyes. She said, we're still getting a dog. I know, I said. And you owe me a new ice chest, she said. <laughs> I poured milk for you, but returned our glasses to the cabinet and opened up two bottles of beer. The meal was starting to feel like a celebration, like one of us had gotten a raise or was having a birthday. I found some cocoa mix and stirred it into your glass. An alligator, your mother said, shaking her head. Cayman, I said. You know that some husbands bring home candy, right? <laughs> or roses, or God forbid, diamonds. <laughs> They're poor wives, I said. They probably, hey, she said. Hey, tell Danny you caught it. Tell him you were fishing, and you saw it, and you caught it just for him. You want me to lie to our son, I said. I want you to make up a story for him, something with a happy outcome, she said, and turned off the stove. She went to the, to the refrigerator and took out the tartar sauce and a salad she had been chilling. The wind lifted the curtains over the sink and sent a few paper napkins gliding off the counter. Your mother closed the window and the kitchen went as quiet as a secret. <laughs>